Let's finish the third chapter of Cold Comfort Farm. We just had a description of the farm. We've met Adam milking the cows. Very old man. He's going to end up having to pick up Flora from the train station. We've met Judith Starkadder. And we have met Seth. And Judith and Seth are now talking over a bubbling pot of porridge. Okay, said Judith levelly at last. Coward liar, libertine. Who were you with last night? Mole at the mill or violet at the vicarage? Or Ivy, perhaps, at the ironmongery? Seth, my son, her deep, dry voice quivered, but she whipped it back, and her next words flew at him like a lash. Do you want to break my heart? Yes, said Seth, with an elemental simplicity. The porridge boiled over. Judith knelt and hastily and absently ladled it up off the floor, back into the snood, biting back her tears. While she was thus engaged, there was a confused blur of voices and boots in the yard outside. The men were coming into breakfast. The meal for the men was set at a long, on a long trestle at the farther end of the kitchen, as far away from the fire as, from the fire as possible. They came into the room in awkward little clumps, eleven of them. Five were distant cousins of the Stark Adders, and two others were half-brothers of Amos, Judith's husband. That this left only four men who were not in some way connected with the family. So it will readily be understood that the general feeling among the farmhands was not exactly one of hilarity. Mark Delore, one of the four, had been heard to remark, Happened it had been another kind of eleven, else might have had a cricket team, with me for umpire. As it is, would be more befitting if we was to hire ourselves out for carrying coffins at sixpence a mile. The five half-cousins and the two half-brothers came over to the table, for they took their meals with the family. Amos liked to have his kith about him, though, of course, he never said so or cheered up when they were. A strong family likeness wavered in and out of their, their fierce, re earth-reddened faces. A strong family likeness wavered in and out of the fierce, earth-reddened faces of the seven, like a capricious light. Micah Starkadder, the mightiest of the cousins, was a ruined giant of a man, paralyzed in one knee and wrist. His nephew, Irk, was a little red, hard-bitten man with foxy ears. Irk's brother, Ezra, was the same physical type, but horsey where Irk was foxy. Caraway, a silent man, wind-shaved and lean, with long, wandering fingers, had some of Seth's animal grace, and this had been passed on to his son, Harkaway, a young, silent, nervous man, given to bursts of fury about very little when you came to shift ma to sift matters. Amos's half-brothers, Luke and Mark, were thickly built and high-featured, gross, silent men with an eye to the bed and the board. When all were seated, two shadows darkened the sharp, cold light pouring in through the door. They were no more than a growing imminence of humanity, but the porridge boiled over again. Amos Starkadder and his eldest son, Reuben, came into the kitchen. Amos, who was even larger and more of a wreck than Micah, silently put his, por his pruning snoot and reaping hook in a corner by the fender, while Reuben put the, sc put the scramlet with which he had been plowing down beside them. The two men took their places in silence, and after Amos had muttered a long and fervent grace, the meal was eaten in silence. Seth sat moodily, tying and untying a green scarf round the magnificent throat he had inherited from Judith. He did not touch his porridge, and Judith only made a pretense of eating hers, playing with her spoon, patting the porridge up and down, and idly building castles with the burnt bits. Her eyes burned under the penthouses, sometimes straying towards Seth as he sat sprawling in the lusty pride of casual manhood, with a good many buttons and tapes undone. Then those same dark, then those same eyes, dark as prison king cobras, would slide round till they rested upon the bitter white head and rattled red neck of Amos, her husband. And then, like praying mantises, they would retreat between their lids. Secrecy pouted her full mouth. Suddenly, Amos, looking up from his food, asked abruptly, "Where's Elfine?" She's not up yet. I did. I did not wake her. She hinders more than she helps all mornings, replied Judith. Amos grunted. <clears throat> Tis a godless habit to lie abed of a working day, and the reeking red pits of the Lord's eternal wrathy fires lie in wait for them as 
as do so, eh? His blazing blue eyes swiveled round and rested upon Seth, who was stealthily looking at a packet of Parisian art pictures under the table. Aye, for those who break the seventh commandment too, and for those... The eye rested on Reuben, who was hopefully studying his parents' apoplectic countenance. For those who wait for dead men's shoes! Nay, Amos lad, remonstrated Micah heavily. Hold your peace, thundered Amos, and Micah, through a fierce tremor, rushed through his mighty form, held it. Though a fierce tremor rushed through his mighty form, held it. When the meal was done, the hands trooped out to get on with the day's work of harvesting the Swedes. This harvest was now in full swing. It took a long time and was very difficult to do. The Stark Adders, too, rose and went out into the thin rain, which had begun to fall. They were engaged in digging a well beside the dairy. It had been started a year ago, but it was taking a long time to do because things kept on getting, going wrong. Once, a terrible day, when nature seemed to hold her breath and release it again on a, in a furious gale of wind, Harkaway had fallen into it, once Irk had pushed Carraway down it. Still, it was nearly finished, and everybody felt that it would not be long now. In the middle of the morning, a wire came from London announcing the expected visitor would arrive by the six o'clock train. Judith received it alone. Long after she had read it, she stood motionless, the rain driving through the open door against her crimson shawl. Then slowly, with dragging steps, she mounted the staircase which led to the upper part of the house. Over her shoulder, she said to old Adam, who had come into the room to do the washing up, Rabbit Post child will be here by the six o'clock train in Beershawn. You must leave to meet it at five. I am going up to tell Mrs. Stark Adder that she is coming today. Adam did not reply, and Seth, sitting by the fire, was growing tired of looking at his postcards, which were a three-year-old gift from the vicar's son, with whom he occasionally went poaching. He knew them all by now. Miriam, the hired girl, would not be in until after dinner. When she came, she would avoid his eyes and tremble and weep. He laughed insolently, triumphantly, undoing another button on his, of his shirt. He lounged out across the yard to the shed where Big Business the Bull was imprisoned in darkness. Laughing softly, Seth struck the door of the shed. And, as though answering the deep call of male to male, the bull uttered a loud, tortured bellow that rose, undefeated, through the dead sky that brooded above the farm. Seth undid yet another button and lounged away. Adam Lambsbreath, alone in the kitchen, stood looking down unseeingly at the dirtied plates which it was his task to wash for the hired girl. Miriam, who would not be here until after dinner, and when she came she would be all but useless. Her hour was near at hand, as all howling knew. Was it not February, and the earth a team with newing life? A grin twisted Adam's, writhing, twisted Adam's risen lips. He gathered up the plates one by one and carried them to the pump, which stood in the corner of the kitchen above a stone sink. Her hour was nigh, and when April, like an overlustful lover, leaped upon the lush flanks of the downs, there would be yet another child in the wretched hut down at, down at Nettle Finch Field, where Miriam housed the fruits of her shame. Ah, dog's fennel. Beards, cow, by their fruits they shall betray be betrayed, muttered Adam, shooting a stream of cold water over the co coagulated plates. Come cloud, come sun, tis I so. Well, he was listlessly dabbing at the crusted edges of the porridge plates with a thorn twig. A soft step descended the stairs outside the door, which closed off the staircase from the kitchen. Someone paused on the threshold. The step was light as thistledown. If Adam had not had the rush of the morning water in his ears too loudly for him to be able to hear any other noise, he might have thought this delicate hesitant step was the beating of his own blood. But suddenly, something like a kingfisher streaked across the kitchen in a glimmer of green skirts and flying gold hair, and the chime of a laugh was followed a second later by the slam of the gate leading through the starveling garden out to the downs, out on out onto the downs. Adam flung round violently on hearing the sound, dropping his thorn twig and breaking two plates. Feel fine, my little bird, he whispered, starting toward the open door. A brittle silence mocked his whisper. 
though it wound the rank odors of Ratham and Barn. My Pharisee, my cowdling, he whispered piteously. His eyes had again that look as of waste gray pools, sightless primeval wastes reflecting the wan evening sky in some lovely marsh as they wandered about the kitchen. His hands fell slackly against his sides, and he dropped another plate. It broke. He sighed and began to move slowly toward the open door, his task forgotten. His eyes were fixed upon the cowshed. Ah, the beasts, he muttered. The dumb beasts never fail a man. They know I. I'd have done better to cowdle off feckless to, in my bosom than I'd a elfin elfine. Ah, wild as the marsh a ticket in May tis, and will never listen to a word from any one. Well, so it must be, sour or sweet, by barn or by, so it will go. Ah, but if he, the blind grey pools grew suddenly terrible. Ah, but if he, the blind grey pools grew suddenly terrible, as though a storm were blowing in across the marsh from the Atlantic wastes. If he but arms a hair of her little goldy head, I'll kill him. So muttering, he crossed the yard and entered the cowshed where he untied the beasts from their hoot pieces and drove them across the yard down the muddy rutted lane that led to Nettlefinch Field. He was enmeshed in his grief. He did not notice that Graceless's leg had come off and that she was managing as best she could with three. Left alone, the kitchen fire went out. And that is the end of chapter three.